Welcome, good afternoon. My name is Denise Rosemont, and I'm one of the managing partners at Diversity Works, a woman-owned business that champions the cause of workplace diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our mission at Diversity Works is to provide organization with the insight and tools and strategies necessary to evaluate, enhance, and thrive through diverse practices. We're dedicated to making diversity not only look good, but also ensuring it's a driving force for success within our organizations. Our webinars are part of our commitment to give back, offering educational insight and valuable information accessible to all. They serve as a platform for learning, discussion, and growth. Our discussion today will reflect on the historical importance, but also analyze the contemporary relevance to these milestones. Our distinguished panelists today are Zarina Harris, CEO of The Note Firm, Kevin Kimball, Esquire, Founder and Board of Chairman of Financial Services, and Ben Anderson, CEO of All Tribes Incorporated and Global Risk Managers. I want to tell you a little bit about Diversity Works. We are a woman-owned firm that focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion, really, and performance enhancement. And uh, if you would put up the PowerPoint right now for us, uh, Holly, that would be great. I know she's still there. And the way that we plan on doing, yes, good, thank you. Thank you, Holly. Yes, we, the, the, the title today is Black History Month, The Legislative Journey of Black America. We wanted to take an opportunity to examine uh, the contemporary impact of legislation, particularly in the spheres of housing, finance, and economics. As I said before, we're joined by our experts, Keevan, Zarina, and Ben. Uh, Zarina will guide us through the ongoing challenges in housing, including disparities in home ownership that traces back to discriminatory practices. Keevan will then take the floor to discuss the financial sector, exploring how access to credit, wealth, and accumulation of investment opportunities are still affected by the past. And Ben will talk about the economic structures and barriers that have uh, limited some individuals regarding accessing uh, opportunities in contracting. Together, they'll provide us a comprehensive understanding of the laws that have impact housing, finance, and economics and how we propose to uh, address this. And I'll say it again, Brad versus Ben. I keep calling you Ben. First of all, I like to bridge the gap between the broader historical and legislative context in your areas of expertise. I wanted to talk about, if you see the sign to talk about the Jim Crow structure that began to crumble in the mid 20th century due to the civil rights, this was a significant milestone. Out of that, we had Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, where the US Supreme Court decision declared that state laws establishing separate but equal for black and white students was unconstitutional. And that reversing the Plessy versus Ferguson ruling of 1896. We also have the Civil Rights Act, which was very important. It was transformative and it prohibited discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. The Voting Rights Act also eliminated numerous legal barriers. So in, we want to make sure that we really analyze these and not to say that these rules and laws that were enacted uh, stop what has been happening currently. That's why we have these two experts here to uh, talk about it. So and then we'll talk a bit about the Supreme Court case, uh, Students of Fair Admission versus Harvard. Keevan will kind of elaborate on that for us. Our next uh, slide, Holly. Go ahead. Okay, we talked about that. So we're gonna go into uh we'll start out with Zarina. And one we're gonna have we have a couple of questions that have already been sent in to us. So uh together we'll we'll try to use this. I want to bridge the gap between the broader historical and legislative context in your area of expertise. I wanted to explore the intersection of legislation of Black America's uh, journey. Right. So can you begin by addressing the difference between real estate notes and the impact it has on the African-American? Sure. So <clears throat> my specialty is in real estate notes. So for the sake of this discussion, I'll use the word mortgages. 
so we can keep it clear. And they like real estate and, and lending run parallel, but they're two different things. Um, for the most part, real estate has had access as long as you were renting. So the issue with Black America is mainly ownership, right? And how many legislation laws were kind of put in place to stop ownership per se. Um, and it's still kind of going on today. So when I talk about it, I'm going to make a distinction between like real estate and the lending side, which is way more nefarious. And I think in a way you can't own real estate unless you have all of your money. Right. And so you have to have a very hard emphasis on lending and lending <clears throat> historically has been very discriminatory. So, you know, just trying to make those distinctions because I'm more on the lending side, which I think is the more subtle, like you don't really know what's going on back there kind of side. And I want to bring that to light in this discussion. Awesome. Great. And Keevan, you could also introduce yourself to tell them a little bit more. Oh, sure. So it's, I'm Keevan Kimball, the president and CEO of Financial Services Innovation Coalition. We are a financial services think tank of doing a lot with uh, economic equity and parity. Um, I'm also the D.C. Bureau Chief for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Civil Rights Organization, uh, Dr. King's group. Um, you know, I think with Zarina start out with, with the housing, that uh, was critical um, because like we talked about lending, which is very nefarious. We, but last week, we ended up with, was it um, Navy Federal or two weeks ago, Navy Federal Credit Union got um, dinged for racial discrimination and lending. So we're going to do a historical context here, but, you know, the truth is none of this is over. Like a lot of people are like, a lot of people want to say that this is a past tense kind of thing and we're just, we're moving forward, but we really haven't. The people, the forces of hate and intolerance never stop being hateful or intolerant. And so we have to be very focused on uh, the fact that the future requires us to be diligent and that, you know, the Supreme Court made a really bad decision last last summer when it got rid of um, affirmative action and, and education and some of the other cases. So I'm going to love to talk more about that as we move forward, but I'll, let, uh, I'll turn back to Denise. Sure. Brad, you want to introduce yourself and tell them the nature of what you're going to talk about, please? Sure. I'm Brad Anderson. I'm the president and CEO of Global Risk Managers and all the tribes incorporated. And we're going to be talking about the barriers that small and minority <laughs> contractors face in trying to be involved and participate in large infrastructure projects across the United States. All right. Thank you very much. Now, go back to uh, Zarina. Uh, one of the questions that came in, we had questions that came in, and please also put your questions in on the chat. And uh, Holly is one of my partners, and she will be looking at the chat. Uh, Serena, can you address the difference between real estate and real estate notes? Um, <clears throat> well, I kind of did it in the beginning, but it's basically the difference between like the house and the loan. And <clears throat> one of them is more forward facing. So people kind of understand that a little bit. And the other is more behind the scenes and people don't really know why wasn't I approved for this loan? What's going into the thought process? What's, you know, the barriers that are happening there? Um, one major thing that people kind of understand a little bit is like the redlining maps, right? Where they say, okay, we're not going to lend here. We're going to lend over here. It's not so overt anymore. Um, and it doesn't have to be. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but really what we're talking about is like two different eras, right? What Keevan said is key is like hatred. It's not going to stop. It's just going to find a new sort of form is transforming. So there's really like two eras that I would say have happened as far as like legislation and real estate and housing and things with blacks. The first era is like, we don't want you to own it. Right. And the second era is like, now you can't afford to. So the first era historically is um, you're talking about the new deal. Right. So this is like the beginning of the modern mortgage market. Well, most like 98 percent of those loans that they were making to people to live in the suburbs and get housing and lending and GI bills, they went to whites only. And then you had other things. You had like uh, the Federal Highway Act. So the established communities that were already there 
we're just gonna, hey, we need a new highway. We're just gonna bulldoze everything down, um, which is why you see every major metropolitan area, the highway goes through the black neighborhoods, every single one um, that's on purpose. Mm-hmm. You had something like deed covenants. So deed covenant said, okay, here's the real estate, but you can't sell it to anybody who's black. It's written right in there in the deed. Um, you had things like urban renewal. So all of these things were designed to keep black home ownership at bay, right? Um, now you fast forward, you can't be so overt with it, right? Because we've had civil rights, um, but they don't need to in terms of real estate because you can't move the federal highway. And so the houses that are next to the highway are always gonna be you know, the, the lesser, right? You can't necessarily change zip codes because redlining has pretty much said like, this is a black area, it doesn't matter uh, what anything says. So when they're doing your FICO score, for instance, it's based on your zip code. They don't have to say, oh, we're, we're not denying you credit because you're black. They're gonna say, oh, well, we know this zip code is 98% black, we're just gonna disapprove you. So it, it it's moved from being overt to the systems are in place where they can be more covert. So that's kind of what I've seen legislatively, um, historically like the two different eras that we're dealing with. It's not that it's not happening, like even said, it's just done in a different way. Right, so what strategies would you recommend overcoming these barriers? Um, first of all, I think one of the main things is we have to know like what's happened. So it's interesting, I, I learned not real estate, I've never really been in real estate, I've always been on the lending side, but I know a lot about real estate because of what I've learned in lending. And I think that's important because what I learned was all the nefarious stuff and what they were doing and why are these predatory loans in this particular area. So I think the first very first thing to overcoming it is sort of learning that history. Right. Um, Just because it happened in the past doesn't mean the remnants of it or the the vestiges of it aren't still with us to this day. So I think that's the very first thing. Um, Also, learning the alternatives in financing. Right. We tend to say, okay, I have to go to this particular institution. They're going to deny me or, you know, give me a loan and whatever they give me, I have to take it. And that's not the case. There's always options out there. And um, some of them are more well known because that's the mainstream. But the alternatives are also there. And, you know, learning about them and learning your options gives you a lot more power in the in the overall system. And thank you for that. And that's the reason when I started out with the Jim Crow, seeing how these laws and enactments have been previously done. And although people think that we're over them, however, some of the remnants still exist. Uh, and uh, and thank you for that. So, uh, Keevan, I wanted to ask you uh, about your since uh, you, you're giving your advisory role in Congress on policy and legislation. Can you provide insight into how these financial policies have impacted African-Americans communities? Sure. And are there any policies that should be prioritized? I thought Zarina did a good job of kind of laying out the, especially on the housing side, you know, there are lots of ways these laws get written. So if you go back to the, the home ownership, you know, when they pass, uh, you know, when they did like Medicare and social security, they carved out, you know, African-American predominant jobs, like for instance, um, domestic workers were left out of Medicare and social security systems. So all of these wealth building processes were, were so, so now you've got huge populations in Florida and other places where elderly or retired people, retired people can live a decent life based on government resources, which does not exist for for uh, for African Americans particularly, um, because when you know when they first created these programs, we didn't get a chance to to um, participate. And you you look at everything. Brad's going to talk about you know construction and and infrastructure, or government contracting. At every level, I've talked to several economists and statisticians about this. Uh, when whenever we try to write, I, I can give you lots of examples. I'm trying to figure out which one makes the most sense here. But under our just recently under ARPA, when the ARPA, which was the American Recovery Act, uh, for COVID, there were all these grant programs, lots of money, PPP for for small businesses, et cetera. And two or one African American entities, communities, individuals were left out of the opportunity to take advantage. So you know someone could get $125,000 loan from PPP if they had a relationship with their bank, which banks tend to be some of the most racist institutions in the country. Right? So they're incredibly difficult to navigate in, the, in that space. And so, or, or the, and 
a lot of states, uh, I know Holly was talking about, you, know, you look at the red lining map of for healthcare and others, you overlay it and you see the, the sort of abusive practices by government, state and local governments to deny people access to, to government funding. For instance, if you want a USDA grant, you have to get the two largest ag groups in your state to give you an endorsement. Well, if you're an African-American farmer, you're not going to get the Georgia Farm Bureau and whatever the second largest one to, to endorse you for that process. So you get left out of that conversation, which is why there's lawsuits. I, had, I will say that the one thing we've encouraged everyone to do is assume more. I think, you know, the what with you know, guys like Bloom and others have shown us with the, the affirmative action cases and the DNI cases is, is that we don't sue it nearly enough. I mean, we don't have to prove, you know, we are not making them prove that they, the assumption has, be, has become that anything that's happening for anything time an African-American moves forward is at the expense of a white person. We need to file the lawsuit and say, every time a white person moves ahead, it's at the expense of a black person and make them prove the otherwise. Because the economists tell us there's no way these numbers persist without active discrimination. Right? There's no way you can have three tenths of one percent of all VC money going to black people by accident. That is, there, you have to have an affirmative of, of effort to deny them access to these things. So that when you look at the when Congress passes laws, they need to they have to take these things into account. Which Brad is going to talk about with his OSIP and the infrastructure, but how they pass OSIP. I don't want to say your thunder, Brad. Go ahead. I'll, I'll leave it for Brad. Would, to, yeah. What would Brad? Bit, um, <laughs> Brad, why don't you elaborate on owner controlled insurance programs, OSIP for us, and tell the group of what that means and how it has impacted contractors? And you know, you're the expert in that field. And Brad, you're on mute, just so you know. While we're waiting for Brad to come yes. up, Denise, will you Brad. talk about the difference? <laughs> oh, there he is. Yeah, yeah. I was going to talk about the DEI and affirmative action. I'll, I'll talk about that. I'll let, uh, well, I don't know if that's what you were alluding to, Holly, but what I wanted to say, what based on what Keevan was saying, that the, I had another question for Keevan, and I'll wait till Brad finishes up. Uh, Brad, I don't know if you heard what I said. I wanted to, you to elaborate on OSIP. And, and tell us about it and how that has impacted what you've been doing with some of the actions you've been taking in your organization. Sure. Thank you, Denise. So OSIP is actually the acronym for Owner Controlled Insurance Programs. And that is basically a process of having the owner, um, for instance, a state department of transportation, the DOT, uh, buy the insurance for a large construction project like a bridge. So if, um, let's say, California DOT was building a bridge, uh, say the bridge is worth a billion dollars, which is, these days, is not a big bridge anymore. Um, the, the billion dollars of construction, historically, the contractors would bring their own insurance to the table um, and provide that insurance to the DOT for the construction of the project. And an owner-controlled insurance program in the state of California would actually buy the insurance and all of the contractors that work on the project would be insured by that insurance. And that levels the playing field for small and minority contractors. Because the small and minority contractors don't have to buy their own insurance and load that insurance cost into the bid um, to work on the bridge. Uh, in addition to leveling the playing field for small and minority contractors, historically owner controlled insurance programs have been able to save a significant amount of, of insurance dollars. So historically, they've been able to save about half of the cost of insurance. So on a twenty or on a billion dollar bridge, um, we can save approximately twenty uh, to thirty million dollars, and we can drive that twenty to thirty million dollars into training, education, and workforce development to put disenfranchised folks to work on large infrastructure projects. And that's really our focus. Uh, it's not only an insurance program, but we're using it as an economic justice program, a program to level the playing field for small, small minority contractors, um, train folks to be able to become small and minority contractors. Um, but the program also uh, enhances the safety on a construction project. When you have all the contractors with the same insurance, you also have all the contractors with the same safety. And historically, minorities have died um, significantly more frequently on large construction projects than non-minorities. And so safety is important to making sure that people of color come home from their jobs every day. Um, and in, in the world of infrastructure, uh, construction is the most dangerous job in America. 
Um, and so maximizing safety um, and making the uh, training education workforce development available, leveling the playing field. Um, these are all objectives of our unique owner controlled insurance program that we are um, proposing to federal governments, particularly state DOTs. Um, the Biden administration through the bipartisan infrastructure bill put billions of dollars uh, into our nation's infrastructure. And it's very important that minorities are aware of the, oppor the job opportunities and are able to participate in that commerce. Well, thank you for that. So, uh, Brad, what kind of legislative uh, support have you worked with Congress in order to get for your team, for your groups? And what do you think uh, some of those are? What would they look like? Is there so we've been we've been working. Um, we started out working on the um, local level. We did a we created this program for Fulton County in Georgia. Um, our next client was the state of Georgia. We designed a statewide program for the state of Georgia, and then we started working with an organization called AASHTO, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, which is basically all the state DOTs. And we worked with them for 13 years to try to get state DOTs um, to use this program. Really, uh, what we what we realized was that we needed to have federal legislation um, that encouraged the states to use this program. And so we targeted Federal Highway, uh, which is the funding source for the state DOTs. Um, and so our the legislation that we proposed was to have owner-controlled insurance programs be the um the, the the standard for all federal highway programs over a billion dollars um, and there are a lot of programs over a billion dollars as i mentioned uh, a bridge of a billion dollars isn't a very big bridge anymore but our target was federal highway and, and federal direct spend so that means that the federal government is spending the money and that that also applies to organizations in the federal government like the corps of engineers um, Homeland Security, all, a lot of federal agencies directly contract with contractors. And so our target is to get the federal government direct spend money um, to use owner controlled insurance programs so that the federal government is enhancing its participation of small and minority contractors, keeping those contractors safe and training and educating uh, disenfranchised people to have an opportunity to work on those projects. So we've been working for probably about 15 years on the Hill. That's actually where I met Keevan. Uh, Keevan was the chief of staff for a congressman when I first met him. And Keevan was instrumental in being an ambassador to me to other chiefs of staff and helping us uh, to negotiate and work in Congress uh, to have legislation developed to support owner-controlled insurance programs on a national basis. Great. And Kevin, adding to that, with your experience in creating connections between governments, nonprofits, what are the most effective strategies you've seen for integrating these programs? You know, the, it's very complicated. And I, will, I, I hate to use the word successful because when you look at the numbers, the numbers aren't good. You know, the thing that needs to be done, I, the government's done, the federal government, when they give money to state and local governments through block grants, have to put more restrictions on how the state and, go, state and local governments use those things. So with a new program coming out of NTIA, which is National Telecommunication and Infrastructure Administration, the, uh, it's called the BEAD program. It's a broadband, they're doing an internet uh, build out around the country. And in order for the states to get their allocation, they have to get a sign off from the NTIA and prove that they've actually worked with community groups and others. And holding people accountable there is the most important thing that's the that's the only way the money gets done that way we've worked in several states and you know we, on the arpa program we have a lot of experience with arpa and even when first they would they wouldn't let people know that minorities know that the money was available if you didn't check the website every day you wouldn't know and then if you did happen to figure it out and ask for money out of they you know usually they just ignored the request so it's not been uh denise to your question it's not been which is one of the reasons why the numbers are so stark, right? There's the reason why, you know, I don't want anyone to leave this the, this conversation thinking that we're anywhere approaching equity or inclusion. I mean, the, I mean, the less than one percent of airline pods are black. Less than one percent of doctors are black. I mean, it just there's nowhere there's the, the idea that DNI is somehow controversial is, 
you know, is racist at its core, right? That, that anyone who would have any problem with that doesn't believe minorities deserve a chance or deserve to participate in that. So I can't say it any other way because there's no number. I have found zero numbers. You, 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 you look at this. If you could find an, a number where African-Americans overrepresented, let me know. But everywhere I look at, we're less than 1% of everything. Well, adding to that, I know you talked before and we're going to allow you to do that. And uh, I want to make sure that everybody understands that the purpose of affirmative action is different from DEI. There's some type of, uh, uh, they're describing DEI as the remedy for past discrimination. And, and do you think that's accurate? And let me just say that affirmative action was there is to ensure equal employment opportunities for applicants and employees. It's based right. on the premise that absent discrimination over the workforce will reflect the demographics of the qualified available workforce in the relevant market. And I said qualified available workforce. The DI is different, but connected. It's there to create an environment of respect and fairness. Mm -hmm. It involves initiating, promoting equal access, opportunity and employment, and a sense of belonging for underrepresented group and people in the workplace. So, so diversity allows for new perspectives, equity creates fair environment, and that provides opportunities for all. So, you know, with that being said, uh, you know, they, they tend to convolute the two and put them together, thinking one means the other. So can you elaborate on that for us, Kevin? Sure. I mean, I think that's, you know, it's a good description. The reason, and one of the reasons why we let it, since it's already been conflated, we decided not to, to, to fight that fight, right? And try to explain. If we don't, in politics, if you're explaining, you're losing. So we have to explain, you know, you know, D and I is definitely a different animal from affirmative action, but D and I only works if you have equal opportunity for employment, right? If you don't, if people can't get hired, it doesn't matter if you have D and I. So, so we decided not to, as, as the groups we work with, and then Zarina Shakerhead, she knows this, that it doesn't really matter if you have a, a diverse and equitable creed if you aren't hiring equitably, right? So that, you know, so I, I'll give you a prime example. We were working with a, a, a media company they were trying to get investment for their for build out of a project they had, and the the hedge fund all the hedge funds said the same thing to them that you know if we were going to do something like this you'd have to have someone from from um, Amazon or Facebook on your leadership team. Now these were two African Americans. <laughs> Does you know do that in your face? <laughs> two African American. You'd have so these are two African Middle East African American men, and they were telling them that if they didn't have basically a white person from Google or Facebook on their board. That the the feed sees wouldn't look at them, right? So, so D and D and I and and affirmative action kind of run together in those spaces, right? So, you know, there's no Facebook and and, and uh, Amazon or the don't aren't equitable in their hiring, and they haven't promoted people internally, regardless of whatever their D and I program may be. So that means there's not a a, a pipeline of people with those skill sets to go out into the to the VC world and get money for projects. So I don't know how you, you know, given where we are right now, Denise, I don't know how you separate the two. Well, uh, we've been working at it and we've been uh, telling people to keep the fight, keep it going and looking, you know, we focus on the strategies of the organization and making it better for everyone. And that is, a, it's a tough balance. You have to travel, but I've seen this before, as I've said again and again, that some of that, talk that's out there is really to keep us off track of what really needs to happen. When you think about DEI, you're looking at really looking at innovation, you're looking at your talent, your recruitment, all the things that you've said. We don't disagree with you, but they are, they're together, but they're different in a lot of different ways. But you do, you need one to, to work with the other, but it's not saying that you're going to focus on one group versus another. Yeah, you know, I think that's fair. Uh, you know, we, I would say, the only thing I would say about this is that if, you know, the people who are attacking it are attacking it for a reason, right? I mean, they've figured, I mean, they know that there's some value there. They're not, they're spending millions of dollars to undo these things. So there's not a, by accident, they've chosen this fight. And so we have to engage, we have to engage here, or otherwise we lose. I mean, you have, you have a situation where seven states have banned D and I, I don't think they banned it because they thought it was, yeah, Zarina, seven states have banned D and I. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Even and, I was just going to add, I'm sorry, Denise, in our January um, 2024 outlook, we actually talked about how the lawsuits are part of their strategy, but not their goal. Their goal is to change the narrative. The goal is to influence the conversation 
and to get the media coverage. And so Kevin is absolutely right. And so we need to counter with the other message as equally and loudly um, about the importance and the value of, of everything that we're all working on. Yeah. The one thing we've noticed and, and we've called people out on this that in business, you know, if you're being silent, then you are complicit, right? If you aren't, if you don't come out and say something about this, then you might as well be in, then you are in favor of what they're doing. There's no one who can, you know, CEOs all over the country can't say they're for an equitable workplace if they're not, you know, voting against or giving money against the people in their states who are banning DNI. I mean that or, or or going against affirmative action. Or if they're hanging out with Bloom, if they're if they're doing his, if they're the banks holding his notes, if they're then they are as racist as he is. There's no way around that. Well, thanks for that, uh, Kevin. We, I, I see some chat questions in the chat. We had another one for. Yeah. Go ahead. We have a question about the different types of racism, um, individual, institutional, et cetera. Can you talk about that, Denise? Sure. Uh, when we uh, let me see the what is it? The institutional. Well, the institution regarding when we talk about institutional racism is the the racism that's sort of internal in the organization. And those are uh, based on past laws, rules that have been enacted before. And some of that's still going on. Uh, that's still going on when you talk about that. So let me how see. is that different from individual racism? Individual is about the person himself. And a lot of times when the attacks come, it's about the individual, uh, the individual, what the person is uh, expressing, some of the bias the person has internally, which is different than what the institution, if the institution is doing it, that's actually illegal. They're not supposed to, but that does happen. So when you talk about it, it's a personal, the personal one is the internal one that the person has that's, that's discussing about uh, uh, their preferences things that they like or don't like. And when you leave your job or your working environment, what you do at your home is sort of different, but we all know that we all have biases and we all you know, bring them with us. So we want to make sure that when we talk about institutional, like it's what's, if it's happening in the, in the organization, you have to look at it, how systems are set, uh, things that historically that have happened before. Are there some rules and regulations that are keep going on? So, to combat that, you have to really learn and engage and be there to do something different than what's being done before. When you talk Denise, can I can I piggyback off of sure. your answer? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna do a two for one because in the chat, um, Holly asked me to like circle back on redlining, kind of explain what that is. And this is a good example of what you were talking about, the structural racism. So um, blacks have always had discrimination in housing, you know, from way back when, but there was a time where um, as new economies were forming and there were black townships and things like this, there was a lot of integration going on with some of the like working class or poor whites and blacks sort of working together. And you had areas that were black and you had areas that were mixed and you had areas that were white. So one of the things when they came out with the new deal and they said, okay, we're going to create these mortgages and, and really emphasize home ownership. Um, one thing they wanted to do was make a, a very clear separation between blacks and whites. So one of the, the ways that they did that was through racial covenants. So there, there would be an area, and I'll use like Louisville, Kentucky, for example. The east side of Louisville is mainly white, but back in the day, it was actually the center in downtown where everybody wanted to live because those were the business districts. There was a lot of money, but there was also a lot of integration at that time. The east uh, part of Louisville, nobody wanted to live over there. It was rural and nobody cared about it. But one thing that they had were deed restrictions. It said you cannot sell to Negroes, right? R written right on the deed. So when they started coming out with um, different maps and areas, they said, okay, this zone is too mixed. So we will create this zone over here, the one with the deed covenants. We'll say that this is a green area and we will green light every loan to somebody white over here. So what it did was if you wanted to live where you already were, you weren't going to get a loan. But if you're willing to move on the outskirts, if you're willing to move over here, then we'll give you a loan. So that's what started happening. At the same time, they built, um, I think it's like, I don't know if it's 75. There's a few highways right down in downtown Louisville. And the purpose of the highway was to separate the races. So they said, okay, 
we're going to go through the black districts. We're going to make these the eminent domains. And they literally raised them to the ground and then built a highway. So it's almost like fencing in like a toddler. You know what I mean? But they did it with the highways. And so if you lived on one side of the highway, you pretty much were not going to get loans. This is how they, you know, kind of created redlining. It was one of the blueprint cities to create this. Um, so they said, okay, we're going to box these people in with the highway system. And then we're going to green light loans over here. We're not going to green light loans over here. So it's very unique because you'll have, you know, Victorian, you know, three, 4,000 square foot houses that are worth a fraction of what the same house is worth on the other side. Um, because whites used to live over there, then they were incentivized to move. So even to this day, what we talk about like structural, you can't change the highway, right? You can't just say, okay, we're going to remove this highway and put the businesses back, right? That's something that won't change. Also, because of how lending practices have gone, when COVID hit, they did an experiment or they did research and they tried to see, well, why are some areas getting hit harder with COVID than others? And they actually went back to these, um, these financial maps that these financial institutions were using to say, we're not going to lend over here. And they found that they're 96% unchanged, which means if you're in a Black neighborhood in the 1950s, it's still a Black neighborhood today. And there's a lot of disparities that go on over there that they just pile on. So you can't change your zip code. You can't change the highway system. Um, and so because of that, if you build something on top of that, like the credit system, for instance, now you can discriminate against Blacks without overtly discriminating against Blacks, right? You can say, well, this zip code, which happens to be a Black zip code, we're not going to give credit to, but this one we will. And so that's what, you know, in, in my, you know, field, that is how the racism continues, even though it's not as overt. There are things that you just can't change. And if you build on top of that without corrective legislation, it just continues on and on and on. And, and to build on that, again, you were asking about the individual racism. That's your individual beliefs, attitudes, and that support or perpetuate racism. It could be intentional or unintentional. That's one of the reasons that we talk about people understanding what their biases are, to understand things that they may not be aware of. And then when you talk about the structural, it's in the system. It's in it itself, as uh, as Zarina stated. It's in the structures and the policies. So some of that, it's already there. You said it's in the air. And sometimes they look at it structural and institutional. Uh, it's, you know, referred sometimes together as the same thing. And they, sometimes you might hear the word systemic racism. It's embedded in your practices and, and that becomes part of the norm. And people, sometimes they're not even aware that that's going on. So I always tell people sometimes when you talk about structure, it's there, it's in the air. Sometimes you can't, uh, it, it's been perpetuated for a long time. So we really have to look, that's why we talk about the historical perspective, not so much that it, the rules and le legal ramifications have already been settled, but it's, it may have still been, it still persists today. And we have to consciously at times look at it and say, hey, you know what? I'm not aware. You're not aware what you're not aware of. And, and that's how we all get caught in it. I don't know if that helps. Denise, I'd, I'd like to, to piggyback on the, the roads um, that our DOTs built through our historically sure. um, Black neighborhoods. So in, in Atlanta, we, there was a street called Sweet Auburn, um, which was the historically Black business community um, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, what the Georgia DOT did was they built Highway um, 75 and 85 right through that neighborhood. And it, it just, for the most part, basically destroyed um, that neighborhood. And that's what DOTs have historically done. Um, I, basically, all infrastructure is um, normally built in the communities that have the least ability to prevent it from being built in their neighborhood. So wastewater treatment facilities, dumps, power plants, um, all these types of infrastructure facilities are historically built in minority neighborhoods, which, again, uh, deflates the value of the property, which basically hamstrings um, families from being able to uh, you know, send their kids to college to to advance in many ways that are tied to their ability to, to leverage the value of their homes, which in America, most folks' homes are their bank. 
That is that is the the wealth that they um, pass from generation to generation. The the historic racism in the Department of Transportation was just acknowledged in November of 2020. Um, AASHTO, the organization I mentioned earlier, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, released a memorandum and basic a resolution, basically acknowledging systemic racism in state DOTs. Um, and that that is significant in that um, you know our our roads, our bridges, um, our airports, our transit systems, um, all the pollution that those infrastructure projects create. Um, it happens in our neighborhoods, and yet we aren't able to participate in the commerce of building and maintaining those programs. And that's what we need to be fighting for. We need to be fighting for environmental justice to stop these projects from being put in our neighborhoods and economic justice that allows us to participate on the construction and the maintenance of these projects as they're built across the country. And more, if one, one, one thing, I'll say one thing about that to that, to what both of them said that, this is current. So a lot of times you hear people say, well, I'm not responsible for what happened in races 50 years. I mean, this is current. It's not yesterday. It's not last week. It's today. It's tomorrow. And that's why it's every, and that's why you can be pretty aggressive in calling out racism and not, you don't have to give people a pass. I mean, this is not, this is not your grandfather's problem. This is, this is the problem of America today for, for people of color. Thank you. Well, the, you have a last, uh, your last thought, Zarina as we move forward and then we're getting to the end of our uh, webinar. Last thoughts. Um, so many. Oh, so um, <laughs> yes, yeah, well, well, Kevin's talking about, you know, like the things that are happening now in my, in my field, because, you know, real estate is so semi-permanent, right? I would say one thing, cause there was a question that came up, like, are there any policies or legislations currently that are going to be addressing housing disparities and things like that. Um, the only thing that I see is centered around homelessness, um, renter policies and renters rights, distribution of funds uh, back to you know people who are in need of it. I don't see a lot of policies about ownership and I don't see any policies about corrective measures. And so there's sort of this well, it happened in the past, we're not going to fix it, even though we're still building on that infrastructure to continue to discriminate against you. Um, some of you guys might be familiar, there was a, an article that came out where this Black family, I think this was in 20 or 21, they were trying to sell their house, and uh, they got an appraisal, and they felt like it wasn't right. And basically, they asked their white friend to pose as the owners of the house, they took down all of their pictures of themselves out of it. And I think the appraisal came back, the second one came back like $100,000 or $150,000 more than what they would have gotten, right? So to say like, oh, it's not happening, it's, it's absolutely still happening. And that evaluation is, is down to the appraiser, right? So it's like what you were saying, it's an individual saying this house isn't worth that much because a black person owns it versus, oh, if a white person owns it, it's worth more. That's an inherent sort of bias that they have uh, that they're still perpetuating. Right. And they don't right. necessarily see their contributions to the problem. They're just like, well, I'm just doing my job. No. Right. And so a lot of that in my experience has come down to lending. Mm -hmm. What makes this house worth more is the lender is willing to lend on it. And this one is not like that. It's really it's really that simple. And that's why I say lending is so nefarious because yeah. one neighborhood. Right. Can be worth virtually nothing until John and Tim and Sarah want to move there. And then it's gentrified and they get all the loans that they want and they get all of the, you know, the financing that they need to bring up the area. Um, and then it just shoves out, you know, the, the people who are existing there while of a sudden, is it worth more? It's because of the person who wanted it. Right. Um, and the investment that they're willing to put towards it. So that's kind of my, you know, all around is like, there's not enough policy to correct these measures. Um, we're just still building on old bones sort of thing. And and to have so many policies talking about homelessness and renting and things like that and nothing really addressing the ownership disparities. I mean, we we lost 50 percent like the black community lost 50 percent of its net worth in the housing crash in 2008 and is the only race that has not recovered from it. Right. We have also never recovered. 
we reached a 49% home ownership rate. We've never recovered from that either. So imagine 1968, right, where they do fair housing. We have 41% home ownership, and today we have 43% home ownership. It's 2024. So, okay. again, to talk about like, oh, let's just talk about homelessness and let's just talk about, you know, renters' rights. Those are all well and good, but let's talk about ownership and what is still perpetuated in the market to prevent that. So those are my final thoughts. As we know that uh, the disparities exist and, you know, there's a lot of us like you, you all are really you, Brad and Keevan are really trying to dismantle some of the disparities and uh, regarding the appraisal, I was a banker for a long time and that happened. And that's where representation matters. Having Absolutely. That's going to fight for you. I went through that situation and I had to fight for each of my clients so that I can make sure that a lot of times that the appraisals are correct or accurate. And as you said, there's biases at place because we're human and we do have that. So part of that structure, we talked about the structural racism is there and the institutional, but that's really having people having representation to make a shift and a change and look at the look at the what has happened in the past and you don't want to have it. So as we wrap up today's discussion, we want to reflect on the legislative journey of Black America and as we looked at it and we we have witnessed a profound shift and some things are still the same but there's a lot of advocacy group that's fighting as as Kevin's and Brad and you in different way and uh we want to make sure that you know that the journey is not over the legacy of these laws still echoes in our housing financial system and even some of the mentorship pieces that Brad does so it's our collective responsibility to address these disparities. So, you know, let's continue to educate, advocate, and legislate for more equitable society. And uh, and and that's uh, really want to say thank you to all my panelists. You guys have been great, done a great job, and Holly for handling the back office. We want to let everybody know to don't forget to join our DI Leader Network. This is a free network that we offer. It's again part of the giving back. You can register on on LinkedIn, and uh, and you know we uh we're, we we want to offer guidance and opportunity and structure to eliminate some of those institutional items that are there regarding assessment, industry benchmark, and leadership development. That's part of what we do as our consulting services. And then we have a private LinkedIn group. Please join. And Holly will put the link in there for you all. And we offer insights and webinars and to help people guide them to make changes. And I know Kevin has a policy. Uh, you want to talk just quickly about that, Kevin, as we move forward? Uh, sure. you have your, your policy that's a uh, webinar. So yeah. yeah, we have our policy okay. summit here in D.C. Mm -hmm. It'll be live streamed as well, but it's um, March 6th, 7th, and 8th. Oh, March 6th and 8th, March 7th, Hill Day. But um, March 6th and 8th, we're going to have a total of eight panels on different issues related to um, diversity, um, affirmative action, and uh, equity. Okay, great. And Zarina, how can they get a hold of you? With your, you want to provide your handle? Um, sure. You can find me. I'm on LinkedIn under the name Zarina Harris. Um, you can find me at thenotefirm.com, uh, info at thenotefirm.com. Uh, those yeah. are probably the best ways. And then you know, I'm around. <laughs> I know. I'd love to hear more about your note process. And Brad, tell people yes, how, to, how to get a hold of you. You're doing some exciting things. And I know Kevin talks a lot about it. I just want, want you to tell people how to get a hold of you. And if they could support you and advocate, we want to make sure that this is a way that we're going to make changes. In, in, uh, and part of what we do here at Diversity Works is to help people transform, transformation. Thank you, Denise. So um, you can find us at globalriskmanagersinc.com. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you. And Holly, you want to put the flyer back up? If, if any more questions, I think we're running out of time and we thank you. This has uh, been a long uh, webinar. Really appreciate it. You can also contact, we can connect with Holly and you could also connect with me too, so no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks oh, so yeah. much, guys. Thank you. We'll we'll send out the recording in about a week. All right. Thank you Sounds very great. much. Okay. You, take care. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Zarina, Kevin. Bye bye. Brad. Thank you for joining us, Brad. I didn't know oh. you were going to make. It. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pleasure and an honor. Or, oh wow! Thank you.